All right, good morning. Uh, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to shorten my lesson. Uh, I'm looking at the time now, and it's almost noon, so I apologize for that. So let's just stand it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Won't be quite that short. But I, I do want, a, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so we will just stand and sing, and we will call it a day. Out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> now, if you got the Heavenly Library with you, let me invite you to grab the Gospel of Luke and go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I'm going to begin with a story that I am fairly confident is familiar to most of you. Luke chapter 19. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he heard him, and he came down, and he received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. All right, when you jump into this story, the first thing you have to see is you have to see that this is a tax collector, and this is an occupation that is a little bit, a little bit unfamiliar to us. Now, we have tax collectors today, and we all pay our taxes. But in this day and age, the tax collector was actually an individual who had bought a franchise from the Romans. Now, Jericho, since it was a major trade center, if you will, kind of a hub where a lot of commerce was taking place, was indeed a tax center as well. And everything was taxed in this day and age. You paid a tax on goods. You paid a tax maybe on the cart, on the wheel of the cart, on the animals pulling the cart. You had a tax on the goods in the cart. Everything was taxed. Now, we like to complain about taxes. These folks were taxed everywhere. Even there was a temple tax. Now, get, get that into your mind. You got taxed at the temple, as well as taxed every single day for every little thing. And so, to make tax collecting a little more efficient, the Romans would solicit an individual from that culture to collect taxes for them. So, if you will, there were Jews who, in the eyes of their brethren, were sellouts because they agreed to be tax collectors for the Romans. And the Roman condition for tax collecting was this. You get us our money any way you can, and if you want to tax even more than we ask, have at it and keep it yourself as long as we get our money. So tax collectors were considered to be a little dishonest, not just a little, a lot. They're conniving with the enemy, if you will, the Roman government, and they were often seen as those who robbed people even more of their taxes because the Romans allowed it. They were sometimes extortionist. They were clearly greedy. And so in the eyes of their brethren, they were considered 
sinners. They weren't allowed to go to the synagogues. If you sold out to the Romans, became a tax collector, you don't even get to come worship with us. You're considered a sinner. You're considered a traitor. We have nothing to do with you. But they got very rich. They got very rich. The story of Zacchaeus is not just a story about that conflict between Jew and tax collector or even the story of a Roman trying to get taxes from a Jew. The story of Zacchaeus is about us. And how do we deal with people who are different than us, even people who we may not like because we consider them to be an outsider or a sinner? When you look at the story, you can't help but be amazed at what it teaches us. First of all, it teaches us that people are desperate to see Jesus. And, 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 and here's a guy, here's a guy that you would think, well, this guy's looking for Jesus, you got to be kidding me. But he was, he was. There are people in the world that you wouldn't expect that are desperate to see Jesus. Now, can I just do something here with this story? If you would, look back in verses 1 through 10. 1 through 10, look, 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 look. Does anything in there say he was a wee little man? No. No, and let me just say on behalf of all people who are vertically challenged, you have maligned us greatly with that line, we little man. It is not in Scripture. <laughs> it's fake news. <laughs> the only reason his stature is actually mentioned is because he was being blocked by others to see Jesus. Now, you and I have got to see this. This is very important. I've often wondered how this played out. Here comes Jesus coming into town. It's almost like a parade setting. Everybody's excited to see him. And you're standing there, and you see this dude that you don't like trying to maybe look through. Can't you see people going, get out? But he runs on ahead. He runs on ahead. And even though he was being blocked, maybe intentionally, he's still desperate to see Jesus. And what this story definitely tells us is there are people being saved by Jesus. I want, to, I, want to, I want to address something here that's very important. We sometimes allow ourselves to fall into the idea and the trap of, you know, I just don't know if people are really interested in the gospel these days. I, I, I've even actually shared with others, maybe even those who you might consider to be influential leaders in a church that, hey, hey, how's it going evangelistically? Well, I don't, I, that's just never going to happen here. I don't think people are really, it's it just in our culture, you know I, know, I know you may be baptizing a few there, but that can't happen here. Can I just say something to that real quick? Maybe it's not happening because of the culture. Maybe it's happening or not happening because of us. There wasn't one person there that day that showed any interest in Zacchaeus. There wasn't any other person there that day in this huge crowd that was willing to say, this is a soul. There wasn't anyone else there that day that said, hey, I know this guy, and I know that he may have some issues, but my heart goes out to him because he doesn't know Jesus. Nobody else thought like that. But here was a man who really wanted to see Jesus. And this story is about Jesus seeing him. What was our Lord's words? I have come to seek and save 
the lost. And I want you to notice, please notice verse 9. This is a stinger. This is a jab of jabs to Jesus and everybody else who had a negative feeling about Zacchaeus, who wasn't reaching out to him. Jesus says, this guy, this guy whom you hate, this guy who is a sellout, this guy who isn't allowed in the synagogue, this man is a son of Abraham. Now, for you and I, that's kind of hard to grasp how big that praise actually is. But to a Jew that day, that's all you ever wanted to be, was a true son of Abraham. Oh, I, I want to address something else here for you real quick. You ever wondered about people in the jungles that don't get the gospel? You're, you're wondering about those people that you think are out there somewhere that nobody's reached them and, and, and there's no hope for them. Have you, have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered about what's happening in their life? Or, or this, how about this one? Here about this one. Have y'all ever heard the song, uh, You Never Mentioned Him to Me? Anybody ever remember that song? I hate that song. And I don't just hate it because it makes you feel guilty to sing it. You never mentioned him to me. I'm going to hell because of you. You never mentioned him to me. That's the essence of the song. Here's the deal. If you're talking to that person, you're there with them. <laughs> you don't think about that part of it, do you? But do you think God's leaving somebody else's salvation up to us to be perfect seekers? And we wonder about people in places that we think the gospel isn't there. I want you to realize what scripture says very clearly. And this is God's promise to all seekers. You see this all through scripture. Those who diligently seek me will find me. Seek the Lord while he may be found, writes Isaiah, Jeremiah, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Amos 5, 6, seek me that you may live. In fact, that's a constant theme uh, from the prophet uh, uh, Amos. Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. And even in the Sermon on the Mount as the Lord wraps up, seek and you will find. The fact of the matter is anyone who is on Honestly, seeking the Lord will find him. Now, you may not be the one who gets to give it to him. You may have said, I'm blocking this guy out. I'm not seeking him. Don't think that they're lost just because of us. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying there? The Lord may not use you. You may say no, but he'll find somebody else or some other way. That's our powerful God, and he promises us that. But getting back to the story specifically, do we see what has happened here that Jesus is pointing out? He saw Zacchaeus when nobody else did. And this story, this story, if you want to just make some application real quick, this actual story reminds us there are people who are desperate to see Jesus. There are people who are seeking. And so here's what you and I need to be. We need to be a seeker of seekers. And don't let somebody else's misdeeds, missteps, misunderstandings, or their misery become a barrier between you and your desire to go and reach them. One of Satan's greatest tools, and please hear me on this, one of Satan's greatest tools is to encourage us to look at somebody else and go, mm, I don't think they're a candidate. Who gave you that right to make that judgment? Are you limiting God's power? Do you not know what he can do? Have you looked in the mirror and seen what he's done for you? Do you see the point? And so here's what I want you to grasp and understand. This is powerful and encouraging. But here's what else I want you to see. Every single one of us know what it's like to be blocked out. Let me, let me do this. Let me do this, okay? Let me ask you a question. And please respond if this applies to you. Okay, has anybody here ever felt mistreated? Wow, anybody here 
Anybody here ever gone to a church or even felt a church? And you may be at it now. That you felt like maybe people didn't care about you. Sure you have. Any ever... Any of you ever felt like you were at a place and there were already the set groups in place? There were kind of the cliques and there was already the set establishment and you couldn't break in? Yeah. Yeah. And you're still here. You're still trying. Do not let anyone hinder you from seeking Jesus. Zacchaeus shows us, even though everybody was pushing him out and he knew he was hated, and let's be honest, he had brought some of it on himself. Is that fair? But don't let other people hinder you from seeking and be careful, be careful of setting unachievable standards. In other words, sometimes, and this is very, this is very hard for us sometimes to grasp, sometimes we expect more of others than we're willing to give ourselves. They've never invited me over. Have you invited them over? They're not friendly to me. Are you friendly to them? Do you see what I'm saying here? It's very easy for us to allow barriers. Now, here, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this question. All right. Anybody here ever gone to a restaurant and got bad service? Did anybody say, I'm never going to a restaurant again? I just can't take it. I'm, this is horrible. Okay, some of you said, I'm out. Oh, so you only eat at home? Joanne only cooks at home. That's all he eats. You still go out to restaurants, right? You just went to another one, right? Because if you don't get good service, I'm out, right? Anybody here, though? Heard of somebody who says, I didn't get good service or treated right at a church, and so I went, I'm done with church. Isn't that interesting? We still go out to eat, even though we know we get bad service. Now, here's the deal. Does that mean it's right? Would that not break your heart if you felt like somebody felt that way about us? It would me. But we all got to be careful that we don't set unachievable standards. And we need to remember that in our own lives, and this applies to all of us, never stop seeking, never stop seeking, never stop seeking. If you seek the Lord, you will find him. That's a promise. I'm a Zacchaeus fan and not for the reason you people may think. And every single one of you that laughed just proved my point. (laughs) I'm a fan of Zacchaeus because he knew he needed Jesus and he wasn't letting anyone get in his way. Because the people that you get mad at for getting in your way They need Jesus to get it. The next thing I want you to see about Zacchaeus is there is that reminder people are desperate to see him. And so as a result, we need to be mindful that we're not blocking people from seeing him. And, and, and that's very easy for us to do, and it maybe can happen in ways that we do it, and it's not really intentional. First of all, maybe we're blocking people because we're not seeking people. We're literally not seeking the seekers. We are so consumed with our own life and our own affairs and our own problems and our own issues and our own things that we are not really stopping to look and look around us. Are we seeking the seekers? Because here's the deal, folks. I firmly believe they're out there. I firmly believe every church everywhere could be growing. I firmly believe that every one of us could actually find somebody in our life that we could help lead to the Lord. We just got to be open to seeking. So we may be blocking because we're not looking in the first place. Second of all, we need to be comfortable with the fact that some of the people who are looking are different from us. They're different. We struggle with somebody who's different. I get that. 
we need to become folks who understand our Lord Jesus deals with different. And when we think of this church, do we see this church as a hotel where I came this morning and the air conditioner's back on? Good, I can come back next week. The songs were exactly the way I wanted them sung. Somebody acknowledged me. I got the class that I wanted. I got the attention that I needed. Is that the way we're thinking that we're in a hotel mindset that, that maybe the brethren will leave a mint on my pew so I can feel warm and fuzzy and be able to come back? Now, here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say. This is very, very important. If you're a guest with us this morning, I hope you feel that we put a mint on the pew for you this morning, that you felt welcomed. But I think it's important for us to see it's not a hotel. And there's a difference when you're thinking hotel or hospital. So don't be surprised if there's people here who are different. And this is the challenging question. Are you willing to let others get in front of you? That's more than just, hey, you want to stand in front of me kind of thing. It's the kind of thing that, okay, your interests come first. You know, one thing I've always found, and, and Cheryl and I have experienced this wherever we go, when you are experiencing a lot of growth and a lot of baptisms and, and a lot of new folks, it's such a blessing. But you know what happens to a lot of people? A lot of people don't get as much attention as they used to. And that can be a struggle. I get it. But are we willing to let others in front of us? And are we willing to put others in front of us? The story of Zacchaeus also teaches us this very powerful lesson. That people are being saved by Jesus. He does the saving. And what I want you to see about your Lord Jesus, he knows the seeker by name. Zacchaeus, come down. Zacchaeus, I know you. Please come down. I'm going to your house. In fact, I'm going to go eat at your house. You ever gone to eat somebody else's house? It doesn't come with a menu. One of, the one of the funnest things about being a gospel preacher is you go and preach at a meeting and you have people invite you over every night and you have no idea what you're getting. Woo! I always generally take an extra shirt with me because invariably somebody's going to serve spaghetti. Just so you know, preachers dread Spaghetti. You're just going to get it on you. It's inevitable. Oh, and it's one of the easiest. To, and I'm not knocking it. I'm not knocking it. That's why I have a second shirt in the car. I'm ready for the spaghetti. But here's what I want you to grasp. Jesus went to his house to eat his food with his friends. He put himself in uncomfortable so that he could touch a soul. We struggle with uncomfortable. Fair? But people are being saved by Jesus. When seekers that are seeking seekers are willing to do something different. Can I ask you about something? Is your friend group a closed friend group? Have you got your set group? Your friend bucket is full? Or have you emptied out 
so that you could put new in. Or better yet, increase the size of the bucket. The people of God are seekers of seekers because Jesus seeks the seeker. Jesus stays with the seeker. And I want you to notice what Jesus informs everybody of. Today, salvation has come to this house. Why? Because the Son of Man has come for this purpose, to seek and save the lost. To save means to rescue from from harm. The lost are those who are going to be abolished or put to death. It is a very violent term when you look at it in the Greek. But they have been saved from peril and destruction. That's the gravity of this. When somebody puts on Christ in baptism, when somebody comes to the Lord, when somebody has found their Savior, they have been saved from utter destruction. And here's what's amazing about that. The Lord can allow you and I to have a small part in that. Any of you guys here grow up with a dream of being a firefighter? I don't know how that works out. We all, we all, we all want to be firefighters or police officers. You know, it's just kind of cool. We all want to wear a cape. Dun, dun, dun. It's just, that's part of the, that's part of the, hey, I'll go in. That's cool. I applaud our firefighters. We have some among us. But rescuing somebody with the will of our Lord's grace from eternal damnation. That's something. And so here's a huge crowd. Nobody saw him except Jesus. And here's what I want you to think about. You know who else was there probably struggling with this whole story? Our Lord's disciples. <laughs> oh, here he goes again. But he's wanting them to be what? Remade to be like him. Let's wrap it up. In the story. Who do you want to be? You don't want to be the crowd, right? Don't want to be the crowd. Don't, and I know most of you don't want to be Zacchaeus, right? Yeah, I'm not a Zacchaeus. You know who you could be? You could be somebody in the story who extends kindness and the love of God. You could be somebody in the story who seeks out to save. And notice how, notice how Paul says it. Notice how Paul says it in Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the kindness and the love of God of our Savior appeared and he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing and the rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he has poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. I want you to see that you can be the person who can actually give something that is greater than anyone could ever imagine. That you can give them the kindness of God. That you can share with them the grace of God. And I know in the story you don't want to be the crowd. I know that you may not want to necessarily be Zacchaeus, but you can be the tree. And the tree in the story lifted him up so he could see Jesus. And I know it may sound odd, but the tree plays a role in the story. But without the tree, he couldn't see Jesus. And without the tree, Jesus couldn't see him. And so somebody needs to be the tree. May it be us. Because the tree doesn't care about the character of the person who climbs up in its branches. The tree isn't weighing good or evil, whether I take care of them. The tree just does what a tree does. And so I want you to picture the humility of a person who has money 
who has influence, and they climb up in a tree because they have great humility. And they see Jesus. This is a great story. Don't let it get lost in a song. (laughs) But may it sink deep into our hearts so that this next week, you and I, the true children of Abraham, will go out into this world doing exactly what the Lord wants us to do. Be a seeker of seekers. They're out there. Go lift them up. Will you pray with me, please? Our loving Father, dear Lord, we're just moved at your mercy and your grace that in this story we see a man that was prone to extortion, prone to be a cheater. But yet, dear Lord, he had a heart. And he only had a heart for Jesus. He had a heart for repentance and He seeks to give like no one else was willing to give. To give half of his goods and to restore anyone fourfold if he did them wrong. That's a powerful heart, dear Lord. Help us to have that same kind of heart, to come to you with that same kind of openness and contrite spirit. Thank you for stories like this, dear Lord, that remind us of your grace and your mercy. And we pray for forgiveness. Forgiveness when we have either intentionally or unintentionally blocked out others. We don't want to be stumbling blocks, dear Lord. We want to be the ones that lift up others up and and, and use us, dear Lord, in that way and help us to see those opportunities and help us to respond to them, to literally put others in front of us. Help us to be like that. More than anything, help us to be like our Savior Jesus, to seek and save the lost. So I'm praying, dear Lord, that your spirit will fill each and every heart that is here today, that our hearts may be filled with your mercy, with your grace, with your heart for the seeker, that great things can be done through us in your name. We thank you for our church family here, dear Lord, and we, and we greatly rejoice with all those who have come to you, especially those who have come to you in recent months. We are just thrilled, and we are so edified by their example and their love, and we pray that we can continue to lift them up. But we pray, dear Lord, it won't stop, that you'll use us for your service. Help us to see the Zacchaeuses of the world. And help us to be like the tree and lift them up. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for that hope. And thank you for the way that you transform us through your will and your word. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if you are a seeker, come to Jesus. Just like he reached out to Zacchaeus, he's reaching out to you. And he wants to come and to be a part of your life and to be in your home. To be with you and to help transform you. To help you grow. And then you can come be a part of a community like no other, his church. So this morning, if you need redemption, if you're a seeker, we invite you to come to him. We're going to stand and sing this song, a song that is there to stir your heart, that you will come to him. But also to all of you who have already given your heart to Jesus. Are you giving him your all? I challenge you with that, to surrender your all to him so he can use you to be a seeker of seekers. Whatever your need this morning, why don't you come while we stand and sing.